I'm in downtown Toronto on Church Street, the heart of the village. All around me, I see a ton of bars for gay men, but I don't see any bars for queer women anymore. So why is that? There used to be a handful of bars for queer women right in the village, but they all closed one by one, and the last shut its doors in 2013. I'm Lulu, and I'm a filmmaker and DJ, and I want to know, why are all these spaces closing? I think that it's super important to have spaces for queer women, trans and non-binary folks, so I sat down with a bunch of people from the community to ask them, why do they think this keeps happening, and what can we do about it? People want to be like, why is there no lesbian bar on Church Street? Are you kidding me? Do you know what the property rentals are there? I think it would have been like financially like almost impossible to have kept the bar open. Social spaces are changing, the way we use them are changing, everybody's online now. There's not even one space for queer women. One of the most recent queer bars and the last queer bar in the West End to close was Les Bar, a bar that was more than just a bar, run by well-known musician Carmen, who wanted to create a more inclusive space. Carmen, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us. Thank you. I guess starting off, the question that I guess everyone is sort of wondering about is, like, what happened to Les Bar? Or we could start off with something, like, more No, we can. No, we can totally start there. I think... Um, if you distill it down to a single point, Les Bar was very under-resourced, and I think that's a problem with a lot of queer spaces in the city. It comes down to like different strata of wealth, for example, like the people that I know that want to go to queer bars aren't the people that can afford to start a queer space. I did the best that I could, but ultimately the person who was bankrolling it wasn't able to kind of continue it um, because we didn't have, I think maybe the attendance to support, to sustain ourselves. I will add though that most places in Toronto have like a 40% 40 40 cap and that's really not enough to monetize. You need to have like a bigger bar to have more, you know. If 40 people come in and order one drink a night, that's not enough to pay your utilities bill. I guess the attendance and like the money aspect are reasons why a lot of queer bars in the West End have closed. I think so. I think that Church Street has become a little bit more of a destination. I also think that for the most part, historically, white gay men have owned those businesses and, and I think they've typically been a little bit more financially um, stable. So these things that have popped up and been these like brief heroes of the West End, like the Hen House is another great example, or the Steady, I kind of, but specifically the Hen House, it's kind of a, a thing where you have something, it's really, really good, it's working for a while, and then all of a sudden somebody goes, okay, your rent's tripled now, or, you know, insert unforeseen financial issue. For the most part, it just feels like everybody's kind of like walking on shaky ground and we, we can kind of like navigate along, but we can't really deal with any huge things that come our way. The Hen House used to be my watering hole, and I knew there'd be a great party on any given night. But it closed its doors in 2015 and left an empty space in all of our West End queer hearts. I sat down with Bobby, the owner, to see how he thinks we can fill this void. Do you miss the Hen House? Yeah, I mean, Yes, I absolutely miss uh, the place, the, the feeling, the, the wondrous like party times that the Hen House was. Why did the Hen House close and why do you think that like so many places have closed? Like I had a horrible Halloween costume last year and it was like so ironic and terrible but I literally had tombstones of different bars. Oh on like a denim vest, like the death of the lesbian bar, like the queer bar sort of. Um. Yeah. yeah, I can speak to why, why we closed. And I think a big part of this was that when I took over that bar, the lot right beside us on the corner was a gas station. Knowing how gentrification goes and being old enough to have seen many, many rounds of this and continuously moving further, further west, um, I knew it was gonna be a condo. So when I took over the bar, it was kind of like, we took a little tiny hourglass of invisible time, we flipped it over and said, 
Okay, let's ride this as hard and as wet and as like loud as we possibly can. And then when that condo uh, breaks ground, we're gonna have to consider the fact that I'm not willing to change the way I operate my business or what this business means to this community just because we have new neighbors who now live in this neighborhood because they think it's cool because bars like the Hen House made it cool. And for us, sharing an alleyway, well, Gay Sex Alley, I'm pretty sure would be very unpopular with our new neighbors if I had to guess. Do you feel like it's like a financial thing as well? Because it's like, I think it's like a well-known fact that like gay man parties probably make a lot more than like queer events or like female oriented, like yeah. women parties kind of thing. Well, for us, I mean, we were a queer bar, so we were able to, I think, see a swath of everything. It, it gave us an ability to not have to be really like high highs and low lows, which still existed within even like a weekend to a weekday, the struggle to have people come out on a Tuesday and continuously having to create programming to like get people to come out and do stuff. Because sometimes like 10 drinks or 10 or 20 people at your bar having pints is not enough. I think more than anything, it just comes down to the fact that like keeping up with escalating rents and keeping up with changing neighborhoods is, is virtually impossible for any small business. I mean, you could be a coffee shop and struggling with the same questions. When someone sets a, like a rent price in a neighborhood in commercial rent, um, everybody then is subject to that price. There's a high high and a low low and they look at those two things when setting out commercial real estate and essentially those numbers, if the high is so high, everyone's rent is going to keep increasing just marginally and then when I go to renegotiate my lease and if you just did yours and yours went up astronomically, you've literally set a new market value for your neighborhood. And they don't go down, they just go up. With gentrification and rising rents, all these queer bars are closing and it feels like we're all just being pushed out. Even though these spaces don't exist anymore, it doesn't mean we're staying in on Friday nights. Along with the dedicated spaces in the village that were for queer women, there used to be parties like Cream, thrown by DJ and promoter Cece. How was Cream? How was throwing a party uh, in the village? It was amazing. So honestly, the first like two years were really amazing. We had such a huge turnout. I remember the first party, we filmed it to use as promo. And there were literally people like swinging. I don't know what they were hanging off of, but they were swinging off of things. Like it was incredible. So I think that's why we were so successful in the beginning and had such a huge turnout because it looked like, and it was, it was a, like, it was, a, it was the right time. And I think that's what these parties, like you have to come in when you're starting this party, you need to come in at the right time when there's, you know, people want that party at that time. They want something different. They want something new. And how do you feel about being like labeled as like a church street sort of? party or like I, I definitely realize I like attend a lot more like West End parties and like the first time I really came back to Church Street is like when Glad Day reopened and yes. then we were throwing some parties there and but for a long time I was like Church Street like Church Street exactly so a lot of people will be like oh hey where do you live and I'll say oh I live in church uh, like off of Church Street like I live in the village and Back in the day, it was like, oh, cool. And now it's like, oh, you live in the village. And it's like, oh, yeah, I live in the village. So people like to come to this area, even though it's like, yeah, it's not as cool as it used to be back in the day. But there's something about being able to walk in this area when you come out at the end of the night and you know that you're 100% most likely safe. You know, there's, there's gay guys pouring out of crews. There's gay guys pouring out of Woody's. Everyone's getting pizza. Like, it's just such a different scene than anything that you might find. Like, there are places, it, like, in the West End, on Queen Street, where you can go, and, you know, they cater to, like, the LGBTQ community. But when you come out of there, I don't know if you could say the same, that you would walk past like tons of people, like drag queens coming out of Woody's or drag queens coming out of Cruise and like everybody on the strip is, you know, I just think there's a, it feels safe here. Do you feel like having like, <clears throat> I guess women catered parties is still important? Would you do another one? Or like, do you think we're beyond that? I think right now, it's really difficult to start something up. You know, there are a few new parties that are coming out and they're having some success. 
And that's amazing because when Cream shut down and we were looking at other venues, it wasn't easy. I mean, unless you're going to a club that is already known as a, you know, LGBTQ club, you can't ask them for their Friday night. I can't go to a straight club and say, can we have your Friday night? Because first of all, you know, the regulars are going to come through anyway, and that's not safe. And second of all, there's the issue of, okay, if we're going to shut down for our general public that come through, what are your bar sales? What can you bring us as far as money goes? And any place that's good, any place that looks great inside and has a great sound system, they already have parties in there, right? Or they do their own thing every Friday and Saturday night, so. So you said that, like, you guys stopped Cream because, you know, like, people weren't necessarily showing up yeah. and coming out as much. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that's the reason why a lot of parties are, like, stopping and there's not that many spaces in, like, I mean, yeah. in the West End? Like, a lot of bars are closing. Do you feel like it's because people aren't coming out? I think, yeah, I mean, I think now with, you know, just look at consumption of, like, cell phones. You know, once a year, you're switching it to a new model. People get tired fast. People don't stay in relationships that long. I don't know, I think it's the same, like you go to a club, you get bored really quick. You know, maybe you have two years of going to it once a month. So any party coming out now, you know, I wish them the best of luck. I think you gotta change it up. Definitely moving venues helps because if you're at the same venue every month, I think that's what ends up killing you. So what do you think is in store for the future Church Street then? One thing, condos. It's sad, but I think that's gonna happen everywhere. So what happens when Church Street is gone? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know what that looks like, you know? Yeah. What happens in Toronto, I find, is like people are like, okay, it's this party. And that party keeps going, and it does very well. And if it can stick around and do well, but it's hard for new things to crop up. It's not easy to get a space. It's just not easy to own anything anymore. And there's a reason why all these bars close down, and it's not it's not just the patriarchy, you know? It's like also just the economy. And when you add in any intersection of identities, that makes it harder to do things like get business loans and like for banks to listen, investors to listen to you, and just like for people taking you more seriously in business, that's like an added um, problem. I'm a very poor, broke queer, and if I want to make a party, I'm doing it with zero capital. And I throw my parties at the Beaver, and because the Beaver is a smaller bar that needs to make ends meet, I can't charge more than $5 cover because people are just not going to pay it, you know? And a lot of queers can't pay $10 cover. And it's just hard to live under late stage capitalism and be gay, you know? Or anybody, but especially gay. <laughs> I got together with a group of DJs and promoters who are all members of different collectives in the city to see what challenges they face in putting on these events. Do you guys feel like it's important to have queer women focused spaces or should we focus on being more inclusive? Like do we still need queer women focused spaces? Yes, yes we need them, yes we need them. I don't party in the village because I'm not welcome here and I know I'm not welcome here when I go to the bars and I know that like when I go to Woody's and I walk in and it's full of gay men and they're all giving me cut eye like I don't belong there and like you know, you have drag queens who are impersonating women, but you're not allowing women to be in this space with you. Even I've had problems um, in the village with um, throwing parties and them being like, well, your crowd doesn't really buy drinks. Experience the same thing where it's like, we can't give you the Friday or Saturday night anymore because you just don't make as much as a white gay man, like, bear party. Or On top of discrimination, like, you working with venues that aren't necessarily used to a queer audience, you get these weird reactions to a space full, full of queer women, all of a sudden, and then, like, they don't know what to do with themselves. You know, if you'd say to them, I'm going to bring 200 women here who heavily drink tequila and um, make sure you're ready, and they're like, well, we'll bring two bartenders and a shitty security guy who's fucking, you know, misogynistic. The parameters are just so much more complicated when you start to penetrate like heteronormative spaces. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you want to create something, right? And you want to do something that's different and you want to open up our world because our world is small and our world is the smallest it's ever been, you know? Like there's not even one space for queer women, like at all. Talk is really cheap lately that a lot of venues like saying it's like, hey, we're gonna do this inclusive space and we're gonna have all sorts of different things here and then they do it and then when the thing starts happening it's like oh I didn't actually realize it was gonna be like this I just mm. like the idea like we get shut out from so many different angles and some of them are infuriating the ones you mentioned and some of them are just unfortunately based on the fact that we are driven by you know the the need to, to, to make ends meet financially or even just to pay the bills so we're kind of fucked either way <laughs> you know what I mean but I think that's part of like the whole <clears throat> bar sort of like system of like throwing parties at bars is like then you're kind of like held to like what the bar wants to do and like how they have to make money. So maybe we should talk about DIY spaces. I know like both of you are in amazing collectives and you know, you do a lot of like text me the address kind mm -hmm. of parties. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of uh, underground kind of stuff. And it's like, it's necessary. And it's necessary at this point because there's nowhere else to do it and the spaces that we've been in we've been in so it's like we want to do bigger things we want to do different things I love it it's kind of like it's like it's it's a it's a revolt against the system right and it's it's almost like it's just a, it's bringing back how we used to do things when we were marginalized queers and like we're still marginalized queers and I think some people are more marginalized than others and I do recognize my privilege and things but it it hurts me to hear you guys say shit like this, you know, like that you feel like you have to get pushed out because I kind of do feel that I'm representing that corporate club scene. You know what I mean? Like we do rent the venues and we do do those things. And why has it become so you guys do this? And we talked about this earlier, like uh, I throw East End parties. What nobody the fuck? Goes to the East. Nobody goes to the East. Nobody will go to the East End. You know what I mean? But the thing no, is, I'm not it's saying like, that why? nobody goes here. But nobody like Toronto has this thing where but it's like, oh, it's I not in, downtown. Why mm. am I in a box? Like, why am I in this <laughs> East End corporate out, party I'm box? Like, like, what oh, the fuck? Like, how did so this happen? Parties. I didn't sign up to be the fucking corporate East End party. You know what I mean? I just didn't. I just I throw things, and you expect you want people to come. You want everyone to come. You know. But then people make their their segregations, and I think it's like it's not just like we feel pushed out or whatever it's like we literally go and it's like not even like like you can say on the poster like you're welcome but then you go and the attitude is different and like you get this energy like you're not really welcome here like we want we want you to be here because it's the right thing to do but we don't it's kind of making us uncomfortable that you even showed up there's also strange positive reasons that it's not as unified because people feel within marginalized communities some of us feel a little bit more empowered to do our own things. So let's like let's do our yeah. own thing. So then, what what do you guys think is like the solution? Like, how do we move forward, and how do like we take up more space and have spaces? I think that just finding the, the like the common force or like that you know that that uniting force should be the thing that we use to 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 propel us forward, so that we can have opportunities to do things in the open and in places where we need we deserve to feel welcome i think we just need a space like it's been said we need like one space like i would much rather throw events in like a lesbian owned space than anywhere else we need spaces where we feel welcome we need spaces that allow us to um, express ourselves creatively um, and we don't have that right now Church is not for, it's not for me. It's not my vibe. I go to maybe there's one party at Glad Day, um, two parties at Glad Day that I might go to. We tried to have a party there. Uh, I mean, it just wasn't successful. It was kind of, there's three of us DJing. We kind of just threw it together. We thought it would be nice to have us place on Church Street again to try and bring back that vibe of like, just come have a drink dance to some good music and then like be on your way or like stay all night, whatever you want to do. It was a little bit of a mix, but then later on towards the night, it was more so just uh, white gay men. Like not really what we were going for. Like appreciate the fact that you paid to come inside and like you do want to dance and have a good time, but this, you have all the other spaces on Church Street to go do. Like this wasn't really it, so. I think the thing is just like not to give up on like trying to make that change. Like 
I know that I'm, I sound like I'm like, oh, I've given up on the city, but I'm still trying. Like I still want to throw events. I still want to see what I feel like is missing or just something different besides one party that we all know and love. Like there's got to be something else that we can do. Something else that brings a different vibe to it, a different table, a different spin on it. Cherry Bomb has been the longest running queer party for women in Toronto, and Denise and Cosmic Cat, the founders, have kept it going for more than 10 years. I sat down with them to see how they still keep people dancing a decade later. When Cosmic and I decided to do this together, I mean, we've both been playing a long time for a lot of different crowds over the years. Both of us are longtime music heads. I think a lot of the reason we came together, we're very different people, as anybody who knows us might know. Music is key to both of us, and we decided in launching Cherry Bomb that we would play what we loved, as opposed to necessarily trying to play what a mass crowd loves. Um, and the other thing is that we decided from the top that Cherry Bomb was going to be an inclusive party. So it's a party by and for queer, queer women, but very much inclusive of the rest of the queer community, trans people, and our straight friends and allies. Basically anybody who's cool and respectful. Like how have you guys been able to keep it going? Because, you know, queer, you know, f women focused parties and a lot of just queer parties in general, like, don't last. Straight up, we're very, very lucky. Like, new waves of queer people constantly are coming out. Our crowd is constantly evolving and changing as we are. We've both had successes and failures or things that have been both for a period of time, you know? Like, we, we both know what it's like and what it takes and the amount of work. Like, a monthly is a hell of a lot easier than doing a weekly or, you know, running a full-time space. Like you said, it's, it's easier than grinding out every week, yeah. but it's also a lot more difficult than just doing a pop-up and saying, hey, we're doing like a Halloween party and like 10,000 people come and you're like, oh, I'm the best promoter. It's like, okay, well, now do it again and do it again and do it again. The key is, is reinventing yourself. So we have the reinvented night. the night and yeah. reinvented the brand and reinvented like our relationship as promoters and as DJs and, and as people in the community and grown with the community and changed with the community. I guess like the space and like all the queer sort of West End spaces closing, it doesn't necessarily affect you, but do you, what are your thoughts about the lack of spaces now? I think social space in general in this city is really difficult to come by, particularly if it's community motivated or community driven. Um, the city is mad expensive now. It's a very different place than it was even five years ago. It is hard to get affordable space. I mean, that's Toronto's history, right? A lot of our, our arts institutions are West End because you could get cheaper spaces and then it's the whole thing. Galleries, club, venues, cool places open up. People want to live there. Condos get built. Condos get built. People make noise complaints. Property <laughs> prices get driven up. It's the same thing over and over and we just happen to be in a really intense part of that cycle right now. I also find that women have historically um, used the community in ways that they needed to. So there's people that want to have a party for say young queer people of color and they will have that party. Does that venue, is it going to succeed as a full-time venue with like a restaurant attached and all this stuff like and open Monday to Friday? Probably not. Let's not ignore the fact that women make less than men. In, in 2017 like the, the average salary of a woman was 87 cents to the dollar. Like women make less than men. It's just a fact that two women together are gonna have less income, disposable income, to drop at a club, to keep it open. And, and that's white women we're talking about. It's not even people of color. So um, I think that that does come into play and we do have to mention that. So I think it's really challenging for a venue to stay open and be everything to everyone that takes to, you know, to get the, to pay the rent. You had to stay on Church Street if you wanted to be open and gay. Now we can go be open and gay wherever we want. So we don't need one specific spot. I wouldn't like going to the same bar all the time, constantly and seeing the same people. Like as a younger person, I want to go and explore myself and I can't do that in one spot. And that's where I think throwing events at different places, doing queer takeovers, you know, where you're creating, like just, I don't know. It also helps um, educate the rest of the community, like not just our own. And it doesn't just keep us stuck in one spot. Like we need to get out there. We don't want to be trapped anymore. I don't think we need a space. We need multiple spaces. 
we need a lot more than a space. Do we have hope? Like, yes. what, what can we do to actually make space? There's always hope, especially because, like, we all want something more, which is to be together, to have good times, and to be able to use our city, which I think most of us actually do truly love. Sometimes it is about taking space and not asking for permission, and we have to start identifying what we can do, whether it be a park, whether it be a parking lot. Um, I, I don't really know what those spaces look like. It feels like there's a lot to unpack in the world, and I think that for me, what I often need at the end of a really long and really difficult week is also a place to experience joy. So it serves a function, it like builds and reinforces community. Even though things are getting better, I think we're so far from where we, where we are gonna be able to go wherever we want. So I think we still need these spaces. It's great that we're still kind of intermingling within like all the different spaces. And I think that's how we get to where we need to go. But for now, as we do that, we should still have a place where we can go without really worrying about any of that stuff. After talking to everybody, I don't actually know what the solution is. I know what the problems are, gentrification, the wage gap, the fact that bars are a business. But I think that the first step to finding a solution is actually talking to each other and engaging and asking this question about why all these queer spaces for women are closing. Now more than ever, we need spaces where we can come together, celebrate one another, and feel safe.